This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here on Truth Frequency Radio. Going to our new time this week, 12 to 1 Pacific time here on Truth Frequency Radio, the power hour, if you will. Also a 90.7 FM in Denver. I am Travis Cook, America's evil genius, back with you for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion. Glad to be back with you once again and uh, i know we're always adding new people to the fold here and bringing in new people to the audience certainly with a a time shift and a a schedule change that's going to happen as well and and we're glad to come in here at this time when uh, there's i guess more people that that tune in and listen and so forth we're going to be exposed to a new audience and i guess over time when you uh have that happen new people are going to be exposed to kind of what our mindset is around here and what we do. And we'll be explaining that through the hour today and in, in weeks and months going forward. We hope you will uh, make this a regular part of your Tuesdays to join us here on America's Evil Genius. You know, as I was putting this program together this week, I was thinking back to childhood, thinking back to my life. And I find it amazing sometimes how, how human beings learn things. I mean, most often when we think about how we learn things, we think of somebody showing something to us or demonstrating something to us. And, you know, we watch it. We maybe we ask a couple of questions, but we understand it pretty well straight away. Most of the things we learn, it seems like, are kind of in pretty short order. Someone shows us something, explains something to us. We get it and we move on. And and it's all kind of self-contained, you know, in one little lesson. That's most of the things we learn. But a lot of times in life, I find that some of our biggest lessons, some of our most valuable lessons, are things that are explained to us, and maybe we question them, but we don't necessarily get them at the time. We don't necessarily understand it at the time we're being taught that lesson. And it might be days, or weeks, or months, or even years before we truly understand the breadth and the depth and the gravity of the lessons that we've been taught. How many times in your life have you not necessarily grasped something you, you learned in school, but years later out in the working world, you ran across a situation, and it the lessons you got back in your early days really helped you through it. Maybe, it was, maybe you had an algebra class in, in school that you thought, I'm never going to use this stuff. Who does math with letters anyway? right and then lo and behold at some point in your working life maybe you're doing a spreadsheet maybe you're figuring something for a maybe for for a job for a you know doing some building or some construction or something home improvement and lo and behold you find yourself in a situation where you're using that very concept that you you couldn't quite figure out in your earlier days it all starts to make sense That groundwork that was laid for you early on that maybe you didn't understand why it was being laid for you. Maybe you didn't understand the entirety of of, of what you're supposed to learn. But with maturity, with life experience, with just more time on this planet, those things often can make a lot more sense down the road. And as I thought about that, I thought back to a teacher that I had back in high school teacher's name, Mrs. Kleinlein. She taught American history my freshman year of high school. I had her back in, oh, I guess that would have been 1988, 1989. It's been a while back. And Mrs. Kleinlein was a, a bit of a legend, I guess, in our school system. She was kind of a lifer. She'd been teaching American history as long as anybody could remember. She had taught most of our parents, 
all of our siblings, maybe even a few of our grandparents, depending on their age. She was a fixture in that school and that community for longer than anybody could remember. A little bit infamous in some ways. If you misbehaved in her class, you might find yourself uh, pushing a pencil down the aisle uh, with your nose. You might find yourself being asked to yodel in front of the class. I mean, kind of things that I guess you would never do in a classroom today because some bigwig somewhere, some academic somewhere has written a journal that would say, well, that, that'll impact your self-esteem. You can't do that. We didn't worry about such things back then. We realized you earned your self-esteem. That a little good-natured ribbing didn't hurt anybody. And kind of kept some control of the classroom. She was an old school teacher in that regard. And there is even a, a legend. I, I almost called it an urban legend, but there's nothing urban about the area we lived in. It was a rural area. So maybe it was a rural legend. It's a rural legend that she had killed at least two snakes in her classroom at some point during her career. She's a tough lady. I mean, no doubt about it. Mrs. Kleinlein was a tough lady. And I had her class my freshman year of high school, which if you lived in our hometown, if you went to our school, that was sort of a rite of passage that you went through Mrs. Kleinlein's class. That was one of the stops along the way to adulthood in that little community. I suppose it became kind of a common bond that everybody had across generations who lived there. Everybody had gone through Mrs. Kleinlein's class. So like everybody else, I had Mrs. Kleinlein's American History class my freshman year of high school. Now part of that class, well actually part of what was mandated by the state of Missouri at the time, was that in order to graduate high school, you had to pass a test on the United States Constitution and the Missouri Constitution. That was one of the things you had to do. Well, in our school system, you took that your freshman year. And when you did the U.S. Constitution test, you didn't just they didn't just give you a test and be going your way. You actually did a unit, a, a, a week or two, of study for the U.S. Constitution before you took the Constitution test, which was a requirement to graduate. So you would go through this week and a half, two weeks of a unit studying the Constitution before you took that test. You had all kinds of different things you would do. You'd learn a little bit more about it every day. And that all happened my freshman year. It was Ms. Klein, Mrs. Kleinlein that taught that. She taught us the Constitution as a part of her American history course. I bring all of this up because on the subject of how we learn things at one time and don't necessarily get them, and then they, we catch on to it years later, Something happened in that Constitution unit that I didn't get at the time. I didn't understand it. I didn't see the use of it. Didn't make any sense to me. But years later, in adulthood, as I enter my 40s, which I don't like to admit, I now thoroughly understand the lesson that Mrs. Kleinlein was teaching us with one particular activity that we did during our Constitution unit. Here's what she did. During the week or two that we did learning the Constitution before we took our test, every single day we would have a pop quiz. Now, this pop quiz was a first a class, start a class, we'd have a pop quiz. You'll clear your desks, you get a piece of paper out and a pencil, you have a pop quiz. Those of you who are my age probably remember the drill. I don't know if kids do that these days in schools, but we did it back then. We had a pop quiz every day. But this pop quiz was a little bit different than most other pop quizzes you would have in her class or anybody else's class, or, or most pop quizzes you likely uh, have ever encountered. This pop quiz was different. This pop quiz consisted of one question. Actually, to put it more appropriately, it consisted of one activity. You did one thing. 
on this pop quiz. The question on this pop quiz was that you were required on your piece of paper with nothing else on your desk, no reference materials, no nothing, just from memory, you were required to write the preamble to the United States Constitution. You wrote it out. You turned it in, and that was your pop quiz. Now, he, here's the key part of this, and here's the part that I thought was a little bit over the top back when I was a fresh-faced 14-year-old in American history class. I didn't get this part, but as it turned out, this is a key part to it. When you did this quiz, when you wrote the preamble to the United States Constitution, and when you turned it in, you're expected to do it perfectly. You're expected to get all the words down there in the right order. You're expected to spell all of those words correctly. You're expected to put all of the proper punctuation in, in the proper places. Capitalize the correct words, not capitalize those that weren't supposed to be capitalized. It was supposed to be perfect. When you wrote the preamble to the United States Constitution on Mrs. Kleinlein's pop quiz, she expected perfection. Every capital letter where it's supposed to be. Every piece of punctuation where it's supposed to be. Every word spelled correctly. Every word, word for word, verbatim. Didn't substitute words, didn't interpret anything. You wrote it like it appeared in the original document. That's what you did. And she was such a stickler for perfection that as you turn this quiz in, if you made any mistake anywhere within that preamble, if you misspelled a word, if you forgot a word, if you neglected to put a period in the proper place, if you misplaced a comma, if you did not capitalize a word that was to be capitalized, anything, if you did any of those things, you got a zero on the quiz. You either got 100% for doing it perfectly, or you got a zero for making one mistake. No matter how small, no matter how seemingly insignificant, if you did anything wrong, you got a zero. You didn't just fail, you got a zero on the quiz. It was either 100 or a zero. Now, I remember thinking, at the time, this is a little over the top. This is a little... This is a pretty high expectation. I'm not so sure about this. Now, as I recall, I did I did well on the quizzes. I, I was able to do it. Definitely made me more focused on it. I, I did fine on the quizzes. But I remember the time feeling a lot of pressure, thinking, oh my god. Isn't this a little abrasive? Isn't this a little much? But we did it anyway. We succeeded. We, you know, I was able to, to, to get those quizzes down and get them done correctly and so forth and do fine. But at the time, I thought it was a little much, and, and, and I truly did not understand the reasoning why we would have to be so detail-oriented on that particular piece of the Constitution. I didn't get it. I did not understand the rationale, the reasoning, behind the lesson that Mrs. Kleinlein was teaching us. I didn't get it. But an amazing thing happens in our lives that we've alluded to earlier today. As we grow, as we live, as we encounter adulthood, as we interact with the real world, we gain perspective, hopefully, that enables us to make a lot of sense of things that might not have made sense to us before. Some of those lessons that were taught early in life that we don't understand the significance of, we start to understand that significance as we go forward. We start to see the reasoning behind things we're told, whether it's some of the things your parents might have told you when you were young and you thought, oh, come on, you're just being a stick in the mud. Or some of the, the lessons you might have, have learned from certain teachers in school that you thought, I'll never use that. Or this doesn't make sense. Or isn't this just being picky? You get older, you have a tendency to put those things in perspective and they start to, to become sensible to you. 
You see the point, in other words. Well, after Mrs. Kleinlein's class, which I did well in, I always did in history and social studies courses, graduated high school three years later. Like a lot of my class late, classmates, went on to college. And for me, it was during my college years that I started to really notice politics a little bit. Now, I'm, I'm not telling you that by the time I was in college that I followed politics nearly the way that I do today. It, I certainly didn't follow it day to day, but I, was, I started to become aware of it. I started to see things beyond simply, okay, there's two guys running for an election, who do I want to vote for? I started realizing there were really important questions being asked. I slowly started to realize that, and this took years, but I slowly started to realize that there was a genuine competition, or even cultural war, if you will, between two groups of people that see American society in far different ways. And I'm not just talking about political parties here, folks. I'm, I'm talking a far deeper philosophical level. That there are people in this world, or people in this country, who look at America, look at our history, look at our culture, look at those pillars that we stand on and say, hey, those are those are pretty good things. They've, they've stood us in good stead over the years. And while nothing stays the same forever, at least let's remember the things that got us to this point and, and, and try to preserve those and use those going forward and learn those lessons from the past. There's one group that believes that way. I would consider myself in that group. There's another group that looks at our nation, our pillars that hold us up, our actions in the past, our philosophies, our culture, and they view it as problematic. They believe that America cannot fully be a great nation unless it is changed in significant ways. Unless America is, shall we say, fundamentally transformed. That's another group of people. When I was in high school, I didn't understand that these two groups of people were at war with each other. Started to slowly figure it out in college. And then certainly through my 30s, it really resonated and it hit home. And it's, it's as I started to understand that dichotomy, as I started to see that battle played out day to day, not only in the political realm, but within American culture, within pop culture, in our music, on our television shows, in our movies. As we get later in our, our social media postings and the back and forth we all have on there. It's when I started to see that and understand that truly that I thought back to Mrs. Kleinlein's lesson and I truly got the point of Mrs. Kleinlein's lesson. The point of Mrs. Kleinlein's lesson that I didn't get my freshman year, but I start to understand it now. The point of that lesson was that Everything you see in the Constitution is there by design. There's no fluff. There's no extras. There's no gray area, shall we say. Every word you see in that Constitution is there by design. It is intended to be there. Every piece of punctuation, every capital letter, Everything you see from the preamble on in that Constitution is there by design. And by extension, that tells you it should be treated as such. Likewise, everything that is not there in the Constitution, everything you do not see in the Constitution is not supposed to be there. You know, as I got older, I went through my 20s and 30s, I would sometimes hear politicians or commentators or authors talk about the Constitution as a living, breathing document. That, ah, it's open to interpretation, and hey, these are all just a bunch of white dudes in the 1700s. What could they possibly know about our lives today? 
their viewpoint was that the Constitution needs to be flexible to the point of really being non-existent. And today, there are many people that truly believe that way. No doubt about it. That is a very common opinion out there. That the Constitution is more of a loose set of suggestions than it is the hard and fast backbone and rule of rule and law of our land. I guess there again, it goes back to those two different interpretations of what America should be, those two groups fighting each other. There are people that believe that. There are people that believe that the Constitution is little more than guidelines and suggestions. That's not what I was taught by Mrs. Kleinlein. I was taught that the Constitution is what it is. Nothing more, nothing less. And of course, there is an amendment process if you wish to change that Constitution, something we've engaged in a few dozen times in our nation's history. So it can be changed. It's a pretty high bar to change it, but it can happen and has. Several, we, we've actually had periods in our history, short periods of time, where a lot of changes to the Constitution were made, where multiple amendments came through within a, a short period of years. And then we have other periods like today where you go decades without a change. I mean, we haven't had a new amendment to the Constitution since the 1990s. And it doesn't look like we'll have a new one anytime soon. I could suggest a few amendments for it, but that's probably another discussion for another time. The bottom line is, it is what it is. The Constitution is what it is, unless it is amendment, amended. That was one of the key lessons I got in my freshman American history course taught by Mrs. Kleinlein. Now, at the time, being 14 years old, and admittedly caring a little bit more about what the pretty blonde in the next uh, row was wearing to school that day than I did about the Constitution, I didn't realize the importance of any of this. Granted, I was going to do well and get my grades, of course. But I didn't realize the impact of any of this. I didn't realize that there was a true battle over the Constitution that was already raging. I didn't have the perspective of knowing how Franklin Roosevelt had tried to flout the Constitution. How in the 1960s, every Tom, Dick, and Harry who had an axe to grind tried to flout the Constitution. And in those days, I certainly could not have conceptualized living in 2015 where we have a man in the White House who seems to be a man who is averse to the Constitution. A man who looks at the Constitution as a roadblock to the things he wants to do, which in, in a certain degree is exactly how it was intended. And is constantly looking for ways to undermine it, go around it, all of the executive orders and so forth. A man who is an enemy of the Constitution. That's what we have in the White House today. I could not have understood that when I was 14 years old. But in adulthood, now that I see it, now that I see the Barack Obamas of the world, and he's not the only one, he's just the latest one. Those that wish to fundamentally transform and fundamentally change this nation, not only aesthetically, but more importantly, they wish to fundamentally transform the things that we believe. Fundamentally transform the philosophical pillars that have built this nation. And they want to trash it. They want to change it. They want to maneuver it into something far different than we have ever known. Now that I see that, and I can put it into perspective, I fully understand the lesson that Mrs. Kleinlein was teaching us. Took me the better part of 20 years, but I get it. Last week, the lady who taught me that lesson, Mrs. Kleinlein, passed away. 
She was, if I recall, she was at the age of 90 years old. Now, this is probably the part of the show where you expect me to get into a real tear-jerking state and so forth. I'm not going to do that because Mrs. Kleinlein led a long and worthwhile and varied life. She impacted a lot of people, and I choose to celebrate her life knowing she lived a full and valuable one. Knowing that any time today her name is brought up, people will smile in terms of the memories and in terms of what she taught them. So I'm not going to do the tear-jerking soliloquy here. I'm proud to have been one of her students. I know a lot of other people are too. And even though she has passed, she and a lot of other teachers of her generation who taught us the right way their lessons are going to go on and on. And a lot of us who are fortunate to have these type of lessons from these type of teachers, we live in a time where it calls upon us to bring these philosophies back to the American public at the ballot box. Folks, that's the first segment of this week. We're going to come right back. The presidential battle royal is underway. Hey, I won a battle royal once. Maybe I should enter. That's up next here on Truth Frequency Radio. <laughs> 